Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Penny. I am a master esthetician in Portland, Oregon, and I'm excited that you're here today because it is time for the Friday Q&A. This is the video that I do every single Friday where I try to address and answer as many of your questions that you have left in the comment section. Today we've got some really, really great topics to cover you guys. We're gonna talk about the interaction of peptides and vitamin C. We're gonna talk a little bit about melasma, hyperpigmentation. I've got, of course, some questions and answers about microneedling and nanoneedling. Just some really, really great questions. I really appreciate you guys leaving these questions because otherwise we wouldn't have this video and it's so fun to have this discussion. So if you are new here, I hope you will consider subscribing and I hope that you all will tap the bell so that you know when I actually put videos out. So let's get right into it. This is a question from Jana Schwab. Jana says, hi Penny, love your channel. Thank you, Jana, I really appreciate that. I have a quick question that I'm hoping will finally put this issue to rest for me as I have heard different things. Can vitamin C and acid be layered with peptides in my morning routine or will they cancel each other out and become inactive? And uh, then she says, thank you so much. Okay, so man, is this ever a debated topic, you guys? You could ask 10 different doctors and you would get different answers. So the way that I look at this is I think that what we're looking at is a specific compound called copper peptide. We're not actually talking about all peptides. There is some discussion about the pH of vitamin C and peptides, but I don't think there's so much of an interaction there. I think the concern is mostly around copper peptides. And in order to understand what we're even talking about, I think it's important to understand what copper does for our skin, why it is important as a, you know, coupled with a peptide and then its potential interaction with vitamin C. So just to break it down a little bit, to understand copper, copper is obviously a trace mineral and it, it, it plays an integral role in a lot of enzymatic activity in our body. There are enzymes in our body that require copper to do their job efficiently. And some of those are the ones that are, you know, collagen synthesis, is tyrosinase. We've talked about tyrosinase and in melanin production. That's an enzyme. Copper is integral in that. Um, like I said, collagen and elastin. Also um, antioxidants. I'm going to put a little chart here so you can see just how important copper actually is in that larger molecule of an enzyme and its enzymatic action resulting in all kinds of fantastic things in our body that we need. Okay, so copper's good, copper's very important, that kind of thing. Way back in 1970, there was a doctor who found that there are certain peptides that have a love and affinity for copper, and they bind tightly to copper. Now, peptides are fragments of proteins, and kind of, um, in short, they comprise all living tissue, okay? So there is a patented um, group of peptides, three peptides that form together and are bonded tightly with copper that form a copper peptide. It is the combination of a peptide attached to a copper and it becomes a new compound called a copper peptide. Okay, so copper peptides potentially have the ability to go in and definitely do some wound repairing. They help with kind of remodeling the bad collagen, helping to push it along scar collagen, and then also help to in the formation and of the good stuff. Okay, so, you know, the question is, does that copper negate vitamin C? Because vitamin C, as we know, is super unstable, right? Well, it's known that copper actually kind of speeds up that degradation of vitamin C. So when you put a copper peptide on with a vitamin C, is it just making your vitamin C inactive? Now, there's other people that actually say the reverse, that something about the pH of vitamin C and the copper peptide, the vitamin C actually renders the copper peptide inactive. Okay, then there are other people who say they're totally fine together, okay? So you've got these, you know, definite um, areas of debate. The way I look at this one is I would suggest alternating nights or alternating using them, and here's why. 
I have yet to see where someone says they make each other better when you use them together. That doesn't mean that that's not true because man, there's so much information, you guys. So if you have information, if you have links to studies or anything like that, please feel free to leave it in the comment section because I am not going to pretend like I know the answer to this question like firmly. This is just my opinion. I feel like until I know that these two ingredients actually make each other better, if there's a chance that they kind of render each other a little less effective, I'm just gonna alternate them. That's what I'm gonna do. And I can understand the logic around copper actually degrading vitamin C. That's the problem with vitamin C to begin with. It's not stable at all. I mean, that's a problem with vitamin C. So if there is something that you put on that degrades it faster when it's on your skin, then I don't wanna use that together. So I would not use them together. And I will tell you that there is great, great value in using copper peptides. I'm gonna do a whole video on it because there are some, there's some compelling information that says that copper peptides actually can help to you know spur collagen to help with collagen synthesis more than vitamin A more than vitamin C and so that's pretty interesting information I'm definitely I'm down the rabbit hole of copper peptides I just want you guys to know so there will be a video coming on that okay. so next question is from Sean Bowers what type of nano pen do you have? Where can I purchase? Okay, so I have a couple. So my nano pen that I have at work is by Resenerate, and um, I went through them. It's a professional company, and I'm able to get protocols through them for you know facials and that kind of stuff. So you do have to have a license to get that pen. But at home, I use the doctor pen for nano and I love it. I think it's fantastic, you guys. I think it's really great that there is an affordable pen that you can switch the cartridges out and have a microneedling pen. You can have, you know, for medical microneedling, you can have it for, you know, cosmetic microneedling and you can have it for nano. It is very cost effective that way. You don't have to buy a dedicated nano pen. That said, you could buy a doctor pen just for nano. You don't have to do any microneedling and it works fantastically well. I have used my Resenerate on my own skin and I have used my Dr. Pen obviously on my own skin and they both work really, really well. So the Resenerate, I just really, I, I got the Resenerate for work because I get access to so many cool protocols and it's a professional level pen. I'm gonna be using it a ton over and over. So that's why I have that for work. But for at home, you definitely don't need anything like that anyway. You can get one that, you know, is more for home-based use. And I definitely, I like the doctor pen. I think that they're great. And I wouldn't overspend. I just wouldn't overspend. Okay, the okay. next question is from Andrea Baker or Andrea Baker. And this question is, can you needle with growth factors such as osmosis or would that be pointless and only stick to hydrators or vitamin C with nano? New to this topic and haven't tried yet, but very interested. Um, and then she says some really sweet things. Thank you so much. Now, here's the deal. In the beginning, when I first started microneedling, uh, it was all the rage to microneedle with growth factors. And in office, I will microneedle with specific serums that are made for microneedling, primarily from a brand called anti -Age. And the reason why I do that at work is because I know that those growth factors are anti-inflammatory and that the microneedling serum is specifically designed to be needled into your skin. But that said, current protocols actually call for hyaluronic acid and the goal is no longer infusion. The goal is your, your microneedling and the actual action of the microneedling is what is the benefit of the treatment. Not necessarily that you're infusing growth factors. Yes, I think that that is fantastic. However, I will tell you, most products contain ingredients that you don't necessarily wanna needle in. They may have all kinds of fantastic ingredients. It's the ingredients that you don't want that's the problem with microneedling. It's not the good stuff, it's the bad stuff. So you have to be really wary of that. And so that's why I really like that Costa Baja, you guys. It's very, very easily accessible. You can get it, it is inexpensive and it's simple. It is hyaluronic acid in a high molecular weight. And I know I've talked about it a lot, but I really like it. I think it's fantastic because it's, it's just simple, it's the right weight, 
and it's inexpensive. So it's perfect to me. Now you can, it is a little thick, but I do find that it gives really good slip, but you can mix a little saline water with it and thin it out a little if you want to with microneedling, that is just fine. But I like it a lot and I would say avoid microneedling in things that if you are not 100% sure of the things that shouldn't be needled in, then go simple. That, that's just a great rule of thumb to, um, to keep care of your skin. Okay, this is a group of questions from MJM111. MJM111. Okay, this says, great video. Thank you for all of them. I got the Dr. Pin after watching your other nano vid and I haven't tried it yet. Some questions I still have are, and these might be questions you guys have, so thank you for these questions. One is, how long after removing facial hair should I wait to use? Now, it depends on how you're removing the facial hair. So, for example, if you're waxing, then I wouldn't do it till the next day, and that is only just to ensure that you have gotten all of the residue off of your face from both the pre and post care for waxing and wax and all of that stuff. Plus, you're, there's just likely some irritation, that kind of stuff from waxing. If you're dermaplaning, you can nano right after. Just be careful with actives because if you dermaplane and then you nano in, say, vitamin C, it can definitely cause some irritation. It's it's a lot of stimulation. And because you have dermaplaned, you've removed you know a, a micron of skin, so there's no obstacle for the nano, which is great. That's a great thing, but just watch for irritation. Um, I would say otherwise, if you're shaving, just regular old shaving, then um, you can nano whenever you want. You don't have to wait. So the only one that I would actually wait is waxing. I would just wait just to be sure that there's nothing on your skin that you don't wanna nano in. Okay, next question is, should I avoid steaming or facials for a few days before and after? Um, facials, maybe, because um, you just, if, if after, because if you nano stuff in, I mean, I don't see the point of getting a facial like the next day. I like to reap the benefits of my nano. And so, yeah, I definitely wouldn't do fa facials. Steaming, yeah, you can do steaming whenever you want after you've nanoed, that's totally fine. And then, uh, can we really do this as often as once a week? Yeah, definitely you can. I mean, you can do it even more often than that, but I wouldn't. I mean, I, I say I wouldn't only because on my own skin, it would be just too much. Um, I would probably end up with some irritation, but yeah, you can definitely nano once a week. We are not inducing collagen, so we're not worried about interrupting any kind of um, a collagen cycle or anything like that. And you're really, really just working on that very, very outer layer of your skin. So, I feel like, especially if you're nanoing things like hyaluronic acid or other hydrators, that it can be really, really beneficial to that surface layer of skin to plump it up, keep it looking great. Nanoing your lips is fantastic and that you can definitely do it once a week with no issue. So what about moles? Just go around them. Yep, just go around your moles. I mean, if you accidentally nano over a mole, it's not the end of the world, but I do definitely kind of try to avoid them for sure. Uh, this says my kit, my kit came with extra nano cartridges that are round, not square. Is the process of using them the same? Exactly the same. Uh, is it a good idea to practice on an arm or leg before trying on the face? You certainly can. You would just want to you know, practice safety and sanitation on your arm or your leg before you nano, especially if you're thinking you're gonna practice and then use that cartridge on your face. You would definitely want to you know, be careful or plan to just discard any practice cartridge and um, just keep the area that you're practicing on, it's still your skin, you still want to you know, clean it and all of that stuff like you would on your face before you nano. Okay, and then you just said, hoping maybe you can address this in an upcoming video. So hopefully that answered your questions and thank you so much because I'm sure there are people who are planning to nano and have those same questions, so I appreciate it. Okay, so this one comes from Irish Gerlach. I hope I pronounced that right. And this question is, I would like to know if it is okay to microneedle when you have milia. Also skin tags on the face. Okay, so we kind of just went over that. You definitely can um, microneedle when you have milia and when you have skin tags. Um, I try to avoid the skin tags, but if I don't, it's not a big deal. I'm not that worried if I actually microneedle over a skin tag. As far as milia are concerned, you absolutely can uh, microneedle when you have milia. Is it gonna get rid of your milia? No, it's not, but I do have a video on milia and I will link that. The deal is that milia is actually kind of the result of past damage to your skin, there are pockets in your skin, and you know that is where the milia are. And so 
theoretically, if we get our skin to a better state health-wise, then we could be possibly preventing future milia by doing microneedling. So it's not gonna get rid of your, your milia. I, I definitely suggest that you see a professional that can extract the milia that are able to be extracted. They, aren't, they all don't come out. Some of them are just, it's not worth it. You're gonna create a wound instead of actually improve the situation. But a professional can get out, especially those super visible milia that you can really see the white we can extract that and remove them and you can move on and not have them. That said, I wouldn't want to put um, unreasonable expectations on microneedling. It's only going to do so much and it can just potentially help to prevent future milia. It's not gonna get rid of the current milia. Okay, this is interesting. This one comes from Beth Crane and this question says, Hi Penny, I really love your videos and trust your information. Thank you, I appreciate that. I'm 47 with some acne scarring and fine lines. I'm debating on buying the skin pen or I just heard of the Morpheus 8. The Morpheus 8 is quite a pricey procedure. My question is, could I get the same results with the pen? Thank you so much for your channel. And she says some other nice things and I appreciate this question. Okay, so here's the deal. The Morpheus 8 is actually um, on the in mode platform and that is actually the platform that the doctor that I work with, Dr. Wendy Abraham, it's the platform that she uses, one of them. So um, I actually got a little insight from her and basically the Mor Morpheus 8 is the next generation Fractura. Fractura Tora uses microneedles, three millimeter microneedles, along with radio frequency to tighten the skin. It, it just is amazing for the neck, that kind of thing. Well, the Morpheus 8 actually uses four millimeter microneedles along with radio frequency and it is able to get way, way, way deeper, not only with those four millimeter microneedles, but also the energy from that um, handheld piece is able to penetrate deeper into your tissue and cause serious remodeling of the skin, tightening of the skin, collagen stimulation. Radio frequency is great for tightening the skin, that kind of thing. So no, I do not think that the doctor pen or any microneedling pen is going to give you the same kind of results as that treatment. I definitely do not. However, I think that you would wanna look at it differently. I think that the Morpheus 8 treatment, it sounds Amazing. It definitely sounds amazing. I think that it could definitely benefit, uh, you know, sagging neck gels, that kind of thing. The company says that it's good under the eyes, that kind of stuff. Okay, so that's fantastic. But what you're talking about is acne and fine lines. So you probably could benefit just from basic microneedling. Are you going to get the same results? No. No, no, the Morpheus is definitely like, it, it takes it to, there, there isn't even a comparison, honestly. So if you are considering doing this, I suppose you just need to weigh out, you know, the benefits of microneedling and their subtle improvements over time to the cost and the probably more drastic results you could get from the Morpheus 8 treatment. So. Uh, I definitely think they're kind of apples to oranges because the Morpheus 8 is just like so much more than needling. I mean, needling is definitely something that I feel like is consistency is key and you know, you're just kind of building an insurance policy month by month to help, you know, improve your collagen, that kind of stuff, cell to cell communication. That Morpheus 8 is like wham bam and give you some good results quickly or at least in less time than microneedling over a series of months to years. So I hope that answers your question. If you do go and get that Morpheus 8 treatment, you have to report back because I went down the rabbit hole of investigating that after you left your question and it looks absolutely amazing. In our office, Dr. A still does Fractura, which is the three, like I said, the three millimeter with radio frequency. And she gets some really fantastic results, especially on the neck and the jowls, just some really incredible results. So that Morpheus 8, I mean, I already text her and talked to her about it. And I was like, hmm, I think we, we need to get that because it looks pretty awesome. So let us know if you get that treatment because yeah, it looks amazing. This one comes from Casey and it says, hi, Penn. I know I'm a week late. That's totally okay because I don't always get to all of these anyway. Would love to know about growth factors. Some say yay and others not so much. TNS has a huge price tag and a lot of controversy. Okay, so it's interesting that you bring up TNS and I do not want to offend anybody who uses the TNS. 
I think that that was groundbreaking um, research and that is fantastic. But I will tell you, and you guys need to do this research on your own, TNS actually uses growth factors that are pro inflammatory. And in my um, research and my study, and especially with microneedling and that kind of stuff, I am all about anti-inflammatory ingredients. And I feel like a lot of times inflammation is a lot of the problem. It is very pro-aging. So I'm not on the TNS bandwagon. And I think that Skin Medica in general has some amazing science. I just am all about anti-inflammatory ingredients and TNS happens to use a growth factor that is inflammatory. So you have to you have to consider those things and do your own research and decide what evidence you want to, you know, move along with. I'm on the um anti-inflammatory train, not the inflammatory. As far as growth factors in general, I think they're fantastic. I think they're absolutely fantastic. I think that once we understand that growth factors are messengers, they are the kind of their integral in our fibroblasts actually producing collagen for us. And our, our fibroblasts, like I've said so many times, very rudimentary, that they are collagen factories and growth factors are the things that go in and tell those fibroblasts to produce collagen. That is so simplified, you guys. But just, just so you have kind of a visual, so as we age, we produce less and less growth factors naturally in our body. So if we can introduce more so that the fibroblasts that still exist can get back to do, doing their job of putting out some collagen, then that is a great, great thing. So I am all about growth factors. I think it's fantastic. And um, I do think that the caveat is if you have any kind of um, incidence of skin cancer, potential skin cancer, worry about skin cancer, history of it, then you don't wanna use them. It's not worth it, in, in my opinion. It's just my opinion. But yeah, so that is how I feel about growth factors in a nutshell. Okay, next okay. question. This one comes from Chris. Uh, Koffel? Koffel. I'm so, I'm sorry if I butchered that. It says, hi Penny, can you use these devices if you have fillers or Botox? And we're talking about microneedling devices and yeah, you definitely can. Now with um, fillers, I usually, with fillers and Botox, I usually just tell people a two week rule. Wait two weeks after you do any of those things before you go and do any microneedling. And you can microneedling, microneedle prior to Botox, but you can't do it on the same day because once you have microneedled, you don't wanna to be touching your face and getting injections. You can't do Botox and then microneedle because you don't want to do microneedle for a couple weeks. So I usually say space out these appointments. If you are planning to go get Botox, either needle a good week ahead of time or plan to needle two weeks later. So you can definitely do it over fillers and over Botox. You just have to have the timing right and not do it right at the same time. Okay, this is the last question guys. And this is from Tiffany Nicole Madsen. And this says, so excited for the new microneedling series coming up. Thank you. This is a fun one to be making you guys. My question would be, if you wanted to microneedle your face, neck and hands at the same time, would it be okay to use the same cartridge or would it be better to switch to a new cartridge for each area? Wasn't sure if the needles got dull, if used for an extended period of time. And then she says some really nice things. Okay, so that is such a good question. Now, first of all, I'm gonna tell you, and I mentioned this in the protocol video that is going up on Sunday, that I, when I am at home, I don't do all of those areas at once. And my reason for that isn't the microneedling cartridge. My reason for that is the lidocaine exposure. So while I'm gonna answer your question, but I wanna tell you first that I wouldn't do all of that at once anyway, not because of the cartridge, but because there can be some serious adverse effects and, and repercussions for too much exposure to a numbing agent. So assuming that you are numbing, I just wouldn't do that. I wouldn't have all of that area covered in lidocaine and then needle. Now, let's say you're not numbing. Then yes, I definitely change the cartridge. I feel like, I don't know necessarily that the needles get dull, but I'm gonna err on the side of caution and I would probably do my face with one cartridge and my neck and my hands with another cartridge just to ensure that I've got really good fresh needles that aren't gonna do any damage to my skin, any collateral damage that are gonna just easily penetrate in and out of my skin. So yeah, I would say two cartridges 
is. And I have to tell you, in office, there's definitely plenty of times when I'm microneedling someone's face and I change a cartridge. If I feel for even a second that I'm getting drag and I've got enough of my solution, my microneedling solution on the face, I'll just change the cartridge. So I, I definitely think that there is value and it is not worth worrying about the cost of the cartridge not saying you were, but yeah, I definitely would say, especially when you're doing medical needling, uh, to change your cartridge if you're doing great areas, lots of areas. But I caution you against that because of the numbing, not necessarily the cartridge. So those are the questions for today, you guys. I, like I always say, I have more to answer, but I wanna keep this video relatively concise. I hope that this information was helpful. I hope that if you have information that in any way doesn't coincide with my information that you just comment it down below. This is how we all learn. And I love this forum for interacting with you guys. And there are lots of you out there that are a lot smarter than me. And so if you've got comments or you have information or I got anything wrong in your opinion, tell me in the comment section because we can have a really fantastic discussion and everybody can benefit. I hope you guys are having a fantastic week. I hope you'll leave your comments and questions for next Friday in the comment section down below and I will talk to you again very, very soon. Be sure to tune in on Sunday for the facial protocol for microneedling. It's a pretty good one. Okay, talk to you later.